So here we are talking about recapitulating the work done on uh, in, uh, reading part of the poem, selections of this poem. Um, and it, it, it's, it's a little difficult, um, so rather, of course I'm not going to tell you exactly what we have been talking about. We have been reading from uh, uh, the work outside of the Divine Comedy. We started there with the Vita Nuova, uh, which we read, as you recall, as a visionary text, as a story of an education as an autobiography, and we try to explore uh, what um, those terms mean and how they interact with each other. How does one term shed light on the other? What does it mean to write an autobiography and at the same time having an education? The two converge, of course, in Dante's uh, imagination. Uh, you can only write an education, a story of your education, if you have a sense of what your whole life is about. If you have some, some pattern of coherence and intelligibility that you can impose on and extract from, respectively, uh, this, the sense of, uh, of your life. But above all, I was interested in, uh, in that, in that uh, partial, because it's, it's sort of inter, inter, it's truncated at the end as a sort of interruption, deliberate interruption, because it, uh, what kind of preparation it gives us, to what extent is it repeated that adventure Dante narrates in the Vita Nuova uh, is kind of ad an adumbration of the, the, divine, the divine comedy. Uh, in many ways, the two texts really uh, are implicating each other in the sense that Dante finishes the, the Vita Nuova, stops writing the Vita Nuova. That's the uh, inconclusive, the unfinished quality of that text so that he can go on writing the Divine Comedy, if you see what I'm saying. The Vita Nuova ends with the statement of a project, of a project to come, which therefore will be, in a certain way, the fulfillment of what is uh, only hinted at in, uh, in, in, in the Vita Nuova. So the two texts are, are literally one is preparing for the other, the other one. But then this, the Divine Comedy turns out the way we were reading the Divine Comedy last time, um, the Divine Comedy itself has a sort of inconclusive quality about it. Uh, Dante reaches uh, and, and, and experiences the beatific vision, and yet his text um, succumbs to the enormity of uh, the task of describing it. And there were a number of reasons why we said Dante does that. I mean, what seems to be and is a defeat at the level of the imagination, turns out to be uh, a great triumph for Dante's own theology, right? Because it's in the measure in which that the poem ends in a kind of defeat, in a sort of the, with the admission of the impossibility for Dante, the poet's language, to contain and therefore reify, circumscribe that which he has seen, right? Uh, he's sort of uh, ending with this, uh, um, this, this question mark, this, this uh, vision of our effigy, as he says, our own image, in, uh, that's all that is left in, uh, for him to recall, which really means that uh, in the refusal to pinpoint, to describe, and define the so-called beatific vision, some people can be very disappointed. Why doesn't he tell us what he really saw? Because that would be the statement valid for him. He wants us, at the end of the poem, to adventure, to take, to take our own journey and, and make our own discoveries about that which remains the essential point of the Divine Comedy, as is the essential point of all great texts of our tradition. The encounter between the human and the divine. That is the point of all the great epics, whether it is in the form of uh, the Aeneid, where the hero is always uncertain about what the, aura, the, the gods are telling him, uncertain as how to def decipher it, and yet he nonetheless pursues uh, what he takes to be, and, mis and makes mistakes, and he is along the way, uh, about what he takes to be God's will. This is the, the way he can live out his own sense of ethical imperative to himself, to his people, 
the refugees that are coming from Asia Minor and going to, to an unknown land and the divine imperatives. Or whether it's going to be the Renaissance texts from, from uh, uh, Spencer's Fairy Queen to Tassos to Milton, all is, to Lucretius, who writes in a theological epic. The idea he wants to, to, to cure his readers, his, he has one reader in mind, a young Epicurean, and this is Lucretius, whom Dante had never read. He, he read in parts and was very fascinated by what he read. Who wants to educate one young man, Memmius, a young Epicurean, to the real and bitter truth of what the, the, uh, the Epicurean philosophy may be. And that bitter truth, the harsh truth, Lucretius thinks is that there is no such a thing, that the, the, that ours are, that the Roman world is a desecrated world, that the gods have fled. That's the, but that is still, in the mode of an atheism, atheism, it is still a theological concern. Because and the implication of what I'm saying is that atheism itself may be a, a way of addressing, of course it's a way of addressing the question of God, uh, the unknowability of God, the distance of God, maybe the non-existence of the gods. The divine comedy from this point of view partakes of this extraordinary tradition. But he does it in a way which is remarkably different. Dante does his theology in a way which is remarkably different from anything else that has gone on before him and in many ways after him. So that I think there is a mode of recapitulation. This is what I, have to, I will have to uh, briefly illustrate and give you the chance to ask more questions specifically about the poem. But some of these things that I think have said, the whole poem moves toward this kind of theology, uh, condensed in Canto 33 of Paradise, recapitulated right there. Of course, Inferno goes on talking about issues of politics, which is not that they are easy, they are very complicated, but in some ways they are rooted in Dante's own theology. There is, it's too easy to believe that you know, this is politics, this is theology. They are always imbricated with one another. In fact, sometimes the best way to understand the theology is to talk about the politics. And the best way to, talk, to understand the politics is to really talk about the theology. They are completely always implicating uh, each other. And Inferno talks about the ethics and the, and the politics. Purgatorio talks about aesthetics and ethics above all, the possibility of reconstructing the human, the, uh, human beings. Uh, so flawed they seem to be, so incredibly sunk into the ditches of their own perversions, of our perversions. How do you, how do you, so radical Dante's condemnation of the political realities, the civil war, people cannibalizing each other, and not in a metaphor that man is a wolf to man, but literally they are doing this. So how do you get out of it? It's very difficult you know, to, to be so, uh, to ostracize politics from the possibility of a human imagination, and then at one point say, well, I still need this. How are you going to make a persuasive case for your readers that they can follow you? And this was the great challenge of, uh, of, of, of Purgatorio. And we saw the, 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 the question of time, the great problem of freedom that all of a sudden seemed to surface in Purgatorio, with Cato's suicide, you remember, with the debate about the soul, the soul and, uh, and uh, uh, created in freedom and by an act of freedom, of God's freedom, to the attainment of the free will. Around this extraordinary concern of freedom uh, and the, therefore the possibilities of the moral life, uh, we came to the, 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 the conclusion of Purgatorio with uh, with, with the garden, the, the garden of Eden, the, the, the place of pleasures, the place where pleasures are not damned in and of, of, of themselves. And the question becomes now, because that, that is the Sabbath, that is the moment where uh, you, you, uh, pleasure can be seen as the crown of work, that which crowns, the coronation of one's own labors and so on. But that is also rooted in uh, theology. And then we ended up in paradise where we really talk directly, because I think that's really the substance of paradise, the possibility of thinking of an aesthetic theology, how art and theology go hand in hand, because what joins them is the question of, not just the question of the art being the temptation, ethical temptation, but now the question of beauty as the mode of revelation 
of the divine. And therefore, the implication was, and that's hope, I have said that very clearly, that art becomes a way to know God, a way to know the divine. So we are moving away from, from traditional assumptions about what is the path to go and encounter God. What is really the discovery of the sacred? Uh, is the sacred going to be found? Some, some texts and Dante seems to have believed that at some point in uh, a particular in the animation of nature. Is it going to be found in the love that you have for your, for your Beatrice or you were Beatrice's for your Dante or whatever? No, and he goes on thinking about these concerns uh, and how everything that, uh, uh, that belongs to the world of art is the part of the path to the divine. So theology and aesthetics, not just as well, aesthetics is a way of making beautiful the, the reality, the, the, the theological content of Dante's faith. Not, and not just that, but not just that. It's, not, it's no longer the question of an ornamentation. That was the problem, by the way, of Lucretius, who at one point says, I really write poetry because I want to make pleasant the bitter medicine that, 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 that uh, uh, Epicurus goes on uh, administering to you. Well, the way he says it, that the gods have fled, that there is no such a thing as uh, sacredness in the cosmos, that's too bitter to bear. I'm going to say it nicely. Now, that's really not so for Dante. Uh, the, the actual exercise of art, it's an ascetic exercise. Uh, you, got, you move through art, you refine, you think, and you question all the things. It's not just an ornamentation, ornamentation being the word for cosmetics, for beautifying that which one has to, what, that, that which he will say. So these were the concerns. And we came to Canto 33 of Paradise. And I, I maintain to you, and there's a way of recapitulation, I think I have said to you, uh, I hope that I have said it all to you, uh, but I will gladly go over it, and I hope that uh, if, you, if you see more, or, or not quite haven't seen what I think I've been saying, to say that's, that's really your last chance as far as I go uh, in, the, in this public mode here. The first thing that we, the, we understand about Dante's theology is the extraordinary rootedness of his theology in the human reality. The Canto 33 is the canto of the, a, a prayer, and we'll talk more about a prayer as a mode of theologizing. Why is it a special mode of theologizing? But the first thing is a prayer to the Virgin Mary. That is to say a way of thinking about how the divine has entered the world of history and the human flesh. So there's not such a thing as an extraordinary, and that I think even talking about the cosmology of Dante, I tried to hint, tried to say, look, the physical world and the metaphysical world are all part of one universe. They are two separate hemispheres, and yet there is always a cross, there's a chiasmus that will connect them, but will make them, because that's the, the irony of every chiasmus. You know what I mean by chiasmus? It comes from the letter, the Greek letter he in Greek, right? That's a chiasm, an X. And when you have a chiasmus, you have a point of intersection of the two arms, but that becomes also a point of flight. Things come together and can be seen to come together, but things also seem to be divergent, seem to be going away from each other. Okay, this is uh, the, the cosmos of Dante is an extension of what he will say in the prayer to the Virgin. The, 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 uh, the human rootedness of the divine, not dualities, okay? That's really a primary item. And this will conclude with the idea that, with the, the, and, and makes it persuasive, that what Dante sees and remembers at the end is our effigy, which is clearly is a throwback to Genesis. Let us make man in our image and, and, and likeness. That's what Dante will see. But this also means that we are in the world of images, that Dante's own journey ends in the world of images. But not in images as deceptive appearances only, that which he, we saw that uh, the whole of Purgatorio is full of, now has somehow the image, probably because of that hour, the shared quality of that image becomes the locus of the sacred itself, becomes not something that just hides, but also reveals the divine. The second thing that I think that we have learned to understand about this theology of Dante is freedom. That the foundation of uh, Dante's own, uh, the foundation of his beliefs, of his theological beliefs, is in freedom. And we talked about the theological virtues, as you recall. The theological virtues 
faith, hope, and charity, 24, 25, and 26, with the various examinations that Dante go, goes on. And as, if you recall, we we're talking about the fact that uh, uh, Dante thinks of faith uh, as an act of freedom. And that's not unusual for those who have any theological interest to, to even find uh, traces and, and, and implications of this kind of statement. Faith is, for Dante, uh, a way of knowing. He connects it with knowledge, which is not a, a way, not just a way of saying that, you know, faith intervenes when knowledge stops, here by stop, because someone who is interested in his curiosity of knowing, now I don't know, I'll try hard, maybe tomorrow I will know, I don't need any faith, right? If you really think about the relationship with knowledge and faith, you can't say faith emerges at the boundary line of knowledge because that boundary line is always shifting. And that would imply the progressive reduction of uh, a, a, a kind of receding and, and uh, diminishing fragment of, the, com of, of, of uh, the dimension of faith. But Dante is saying by connecting a university examination and the problem of faith is that faith itself is a way of knowing. I have faith and that means that I see the world in an entirely different way. I can see myself disengaged from everything around me. I can see that nothing really matters, that all the patterns and, and parameters of reasons are going to be found wanting. That's really, so it's tied with freedom. Hope introduces the question of the future and you cannot have freedom without the future. We talked about this temporal issues. You can only think about the possibility of a future if you believe that there is a novelty, if there is a freedom, if you are in bondage, you cannot really think of that. But philologically, because I don't want to confuse you at all, you remember that all the three cantos were literally woven with references to Exodus. All three cantos. And the story of Exodus, which is crucial, to Dante's poetic figuration is the story of the freedom from a state of bondage. So this is the way we understand freedom. But Dante also knows that freedom can, you only have to shift. You know, this is, this is Luther, of course, that freedom and faith are one and the same thing. In this attack, you remember that I mentioned this to you, doesn't concern Dante, but concerns the issue. And so we'll mention it for clarity. They debate, the two of them, Luther and Erasmus, over the idea of what freedom of the will means. And they're really debating a text written a century earlier by one humanist by the name of Valla. And they disagree about what that text means. And, and Luther says, well, to Erasmus, you really are, are interested in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in faith uh, as a form of order. Uh, I'm interested in faith as a form of freedom because that frees me from all loyalties. It's a lot of madness. Uh, the sublime quality of the statement. But you only have to shift that, the ground a little bit and realize that freedom can really become, and is, the source of atheism. Because I, atheism all of a sudden becomes important because human beings don't want to be subjected to anybody. It's part of the project to say, I am my own man. I am my own woman. I want to do exactly what I want. I don't want to have any loyalties or ac uh, accept uh, anything that I don't even see. I mean, like we, can, we can bear with a master, you know, that we see and maybe has a, a knife uh, uh, at us, but someone that, you know, is a distant and remote. We, and but Dante then says, that's the peculiarity of this religious belief of mine, which is really all about freedom, including the freedom to deny the divinity. This is extraordinary, never heard of in the history of, as far as I know, and I have a very limited knowledge, believe me, there's no rhetoric, very limited knowledge, but I have never seen anything like this. The third element about this theology is really the, the great element of love, to discover that the way to God, yes, it's hard, there are many ways, first of all, to God. There is the philosophical way of going through knowing, there is the, the linguistic way through the language, and I'll come to this issue in a moment. There is poetry, there is the world of beauty, there is the language of the heart, but that primarily it is the, the path to the divine is love, right? Because that, in which to Dante, and Dante understands, I wasn't saying that love is so mysterious because I know that deep down you are your young people, many of you, a couple here are 
younger, much younger than I am, but not really that young, so they are not surprised by any of this. But you know, but I know that deep down, I remember being young, how oh, you think about the mystery of love, ah, oh, that really speaks to everybody's heart. I wasn't meaning it that way. But it is really a full point that the principle of election, which is so crucial to love, it really can, cannot be quite explained. I really was meaning it in, in as theological a way as possible. I was already thinking about the statements that I was uh, going to make today about Dante's theology. So this is, these are some of the issues that Dante has. But the other day, yesterday, the day before, I was asked the question about one line in Dante. And I was very, actually, it was a very good question about the fact that Dante is allowed to see the truth. That, that the light he saw was the truth. That was a very good question. So what does it mean? Uh, to me, it was so clear, and I apologize. Because, you know, I said, well, this is really the biblical idea in your light, which your notes will tell you. In your light, uh, I see the light. We see the light. What does it mean? In your light, we see the light. And what it is is that it's part of this mystery that if you are a mystic, and you think that the divine is wrapped in the kind of uh, transcendent darkness, you know, that's the language, or that it is really all wrapped in uh, impenetrable light. It's both the same, because neither light has the peculiarity of never letting you see the origin of the light. And darkness has that peculiarity of never letting you see the origin of the darkness. When Dante reaches Paradiso 33, and that's the meaning in your light, I see, we see the light, Dante sees finally the origin of light. That's the point. That's the point. So there are moments where his sight can become so incredibly sharp and so penetrating. So look at all these ways. The, ways that, the many ways in which we can take available to us, and it seems that we are always stumbling against something that, in the long run, you have to stop. And yet, if you love, if you, if you think that beauty is, uh, is uh, part, which is part of love, beauty is, is part of uh, love, is the hunger for beauty, the Neoplatonists will say, in, in the Florentine Neoplatonist, Lorenzo. Uh, I don't know where he found it, probably in Plotinus. Uh, love is the hunger for beauty. But all these are ways that Dante uh, keeps opening for us, uh, opening for us in our journey to the divine. And then there is the prayer, which is the question of language. That has also become one of the ways in which I indicate that there is a, a theological, uh, uh, a theological root to the question of language. You know, not only that we speak out of, and speaking and language is an allegory a parable of, of, of our desires, right? A parable of what we lack. We speak because we don't have. That's the specific, and we speak because we are designating and we are pointing, maybe without really knowing, to what we, uh, uh, what we need. It's always a question of need. And Dante has always a way of connecting language and desire. We talked about that all the time. That's one of the themes we discussed. And then all of a sudden, in Paradiso 33, though, I, I said to you, look, the language now changes. All of us, first of all, the prayer to the Virgin is all about longing, the state of longing, but not languishing. And there is an etymological connection there somewhere, which is not, I'm not going to get, get into, but this a longing for the divine to show itself. Bernard of Clairvaux, the great mystic, he who is the great, fierce opponent of Abelard appears on the scene and therefore they, you got over here the polemics which we haven't got time for, the polemics between Abelard and Bernard that are clearly behind his apparition in Paradiso 33. They all are waiting for the divine to show itself forth, right? And this language, and yet this desire all of a sudden becomes the language of joy, of enjoyment. And that's such an extraordinary shift. Why? Because Dante understands uh, the problem with desire. Of course we like to, you know, we're always talking about how much, how permanent we like to be in a state of permanent desires. Because that's what makes us feel alive, young, right? You desire, you want something. But, and it's true, it's true. It's part of the great power of desire and the language of desire. But if desire were without an object ever, 
then desire becomes of the greatest absurdity and futility. If we go around thinking that we're in a labyrinth of desires, then really that is, this is a joke. Desire becomes a joke. So Dante places this idea of enjoyment, the possibility of this sweetness that it distills in his heart. These are the issues. And then finally, this idea of prayer. And I want to stop there. Uh, I'm stop with the question of prayer and then uh, get, get your questions. Because the whole poem, I think, from the perspective of Paradiso 33, taking a retrospective with a view, not only that the fact that there, there are references to uh, the first words Dante uses in Inferno 1 is a prayer, right? Miserere di me. He says, have mercy on me. He doesn't even know whether you're a shade or a man. He sees something, a shape, indistinct. Turns out to be Virgil. This is a poetry that lends itself and offers itself completely freely. You know, you can go to the library and pick up a book, a free act of, of, of someone's generosity. There it is, he turns to it and begins with a prayer. And the poem ends with a prayer. And, ends with a, and begins with a prayer, because the whole poem, the real quality and nature of, of language is to be a prayer. A prayer implying the tension that we have all the time toward what, for Dante, toward what necessarily transcends us. So there is always a reality that is touched directly by the hand of God, but escapes the world of, uh, uh, of, of the human plans and human, uh, the human projects. This is what I think the whole poem is about. Um, and it's above all a poem addressed to the future, addressed to us, that is to say, it's not a poem about the past. Dante is the least nostalgic of poets. It's so easy, you know, if you really go, go ever and you tell your grandchildren you read Dante, I thought that Dante is a nice little story about the Middle Ages. We are all nostalgic about the Middle Ages. Maybe some of you are here, how are these guys? How are they living in a world of absolute certainties, right? No, Dante is the poet of openness, the poet who understands reason and, and understands understands uh, the, the uh, risk. Now that's really what, it, what, what, what this poem is about, the poem about the future, the poem addressed with a number of apostrophes to readers. And whenever you read apostrophe to readers from the beginning of Inferno to roughly Paradiso 10, every so often Dante addresses us. You remember then I said at one point he stops. He made this point. What are these addresses to readers? We can read it whenever you have that kind of uh, up to the 18th century, you always read novels. Now, my dear reader, now my gentle reader, they're coaxing you, pretending they're coaxing you. They couldn't care whether you read it or not, I don't think, ultimately. And Dante doesn't really care whether we are reading him or not. Now who are you following the little ship of poetry, the few of you, and I think he means it, who are not afraid of how, uh, how, how uh, rough the, the seas are, right? You could, you could shipwreck and all of that. Of course, you can read those, uh, those, those apostrophes as a way of saying, look, uh, I need you readers because if I have readers, I'm constituting myself into an author, right? Because in, in the measure in which there are readers, then I am the author. I am I'm an author because I have I managed, because the poem has made me into an author. Of course, there is that. But what I think this is about is you are going to use my poem as the boat with which you can start your own journey. That's the understanding of the future. The poet, Dante, is a poet of the future, which is a way of saying, and there is a little bit of irony as I say this, uh, that Dante is not the poet of the past, he's where the poet toward which we are going. The Middle Ages may not be a time of the past, may be the Middle Ages in a different form, will certainly will come back, will probably come back in the future. This is what Dante, clearly things. So let's go now with your questions. I hope you have many and uh, not many, I mean few so that we can talk a little bit about this. Yes, uh, whoever wants to, uh, you came in late so I must say, uh, I must repeat this. You have to sign and there is that beautiful young woman right there, Maria Derdipanska. Oh, that adjective, you forgive me, but it's true, but also. Uh, and uh, the other thing is uh, you have to talk very closely to a microphone. All right. Okay. Uh, 
Well, I wanted to talk a little bit more about desire, and I'm glad you brought that up because it's been on my mind for the last couple of days. Um, I was just reading Shakespeare's 147th sonnet yesterday in which he says, desire is death. Yeah. And it struck me how different Dante's conception of desire is and that it's something that he seems to want to stay in and relish, and it's, it's almost life to him. Um, we started this course with the Vita Nova, and I, I got so frustrated reading it, because I, I, part of me was saying, if you love this woman so much, why don't you do something about it, you know? But it's like, Dante, no, he wants to stay, you know, in this place of longing. Longing is, is life for him in some way. Um, and... So that seems to me something vitally important to understanding what the Divine Comedy means. And I wonder if you could just go back and talk a little bit about the courtly love tradition, how that might have influenced Dante's thinking about desire. And, and more specifically, in a spiritual sense, as to um, Dante's theology, how desire played a role in Dante's conception of, of his relationship to God. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, good, good, good question. I like the fact that you bring in, I will take the points as I remember them, but, but also following it, my own law in the logic. I like the way you bring in uh, Shakespeare's understanding of desire and that desire, it's not that it's really death, but ends in death. Right, that, that desire leads you to death, right? That this is a kind of, uh, uh, that is in many ways also uh, a view largely shared by Dante in this sense, but it's not only that, Dante does not stop there. In this sense that you have to understand that there's such a thing as a metaphysics of desire. I don't know if uh, the term is new to you or not. What could that, phrase possibly mean? What do we talk about? What does it mean? Bit other than it's metaphysics of desire. Some of you may be a little bit uh, uh, unusual. It really means this, that desire, that there's a dialectics to desire, a movement to desire, that necessarily I want this today, then I want that. The desire is inexhaustible. That's what it means. And, and from that point of view, it's very important for uh, all those like Augustine, it's part of this restlessness of the heart, as St. Augustine mentions. That's the, the a theological understanding of this idea. We call it metaphysical because it really wants the absolute. Desire by definition. I want now this, you know, the smoking of a cigarette for a great novelist, an Italian novelist at the beginning of the last century, uh, was the, the true emblem of desire, ending in ashes, but always like a phoenix, you can start over again, etc. This is, but it really means that it always, it will come to an end, either in death, in nothingness, when finally you renounce all desire, which is the death of desire, or some idea of the absolute of God. That's really, that's what we mean by the absolute, the, the, this absolute uh, tension that desire entails. Now then you ask me to uh, talk about the Vita Nuova and the uneasiness you had. I mean, you expressed the uneasiness and I respect your uneasiness. I know uh, a man of action like you, uh, student of philosophy as you are, uh, then uh, you, you obviously have, uh, have that kind of, I think that you're supposed to have that. There is such a thing as a passivity of the, of, uh, the state of dejection, the sense of the mastery of love that throws the lover poet into, who doesn't even understand what love is at this point. That's what part of the education is. He wants to, you know, the story of the Vita Nuova is the story of a poet who knows, no, he, he doesn't know Beatrice. He calls her Beatrice only because in, when in the nearness of her, he would feel beatitude. That's what he says. You know, so uh, there's a kind of arbitrariness to names. We don't care about that now. We, we go on with, uh, anyway. so there is this idea that he is uh, the power of love dejects him. It's not yet a virtue, it's a passion. And the word passion it really implies that. We think that a passion is what makes us go, but Dante makes a careful distinction uh, of uh, uh, the will that becomes paralyzed, the desire to be discovered by the woman he loves. You know, it's very important for him that she says hi. 
uh, when she, they meet in the streets and he, she won't say hi. And so he goes home and is dejected once and I'm worthless, etc. So that is, he's explaining that kind of, uh, that sort of state of dejection that love can bring in, or the passion of love can bring into the mind. The mind is, 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 un, is clouded, uh, unable to think straight, but that for him also sheds light on the way he understands poetry. So, because he waits for poetry, he comes, he's a sort of poet, very romantic poet, who doesn't think that poetry entails discipline? You know, you, you, it's almost like somebody else says, you know, it's all, almost all going to the, the office at 7 a.m., you sit down at the, at the desk and keep at it, and then maybe you manage to come up with a great line. He hopes for, romantically, for poetry to come to him, for inspiration to come to him. And then he realizes that his understanding of love was as wrong as his, of the love passion was as wrong as his understanding of poetry, that you gotta really get down and do something about it. When he understands it, it's too late for him because Beatrice has died. So now the poem, the, the project of the Divine Comedy, because she, she maybe, he has a vision, he sees her uh, at the foot of, of uh, God's majesty, says, I want to go there and meet with her. That's by action, that's action. You will agree that that really is quite, uh, has completely changed. How does this understanding of love connect with uh, the courtly love tradition? Uh, that is really not a difficult question. In fact, I would give you a little bit of uh, bibliography that uh, uh, C.S. Lewis, has written a very good book on uh, the allegory of love, a book written probably in the late 50s, but last time I read it, which was recently, some 20 years ago, it was still very good, very powerful. Um, the idea is this, uh, and I'm really paraphrasing C.S. Lewis more or less, I mean, with a lot of uh, uh, gaps in my mind about the, the, the richness of the text, uh, that clearly what we think of love today as a romantic understanding, it's really a discovery of the Middle Ages. And I have been talking about the fact that, as you may all recall, the Greeks didn't have this romantic understanding of love. The Romans didn't have this understanding of love. You know, when you read Catullus, uh, uh, the passion for a woman is something, you know, that uh, <coughs> he's always uh, uh, a little uneasy about. That's not what a virtuous man should be doing. It's a weakness. It's a weakness of the will. The weakness of the will, you know, it's a vice, what can you do? We are fallible, we are Romans, but we are also occasionally a little fallible. But the idea of romantic love comes with Provencal poets in the south of France, uh, what you call courtly love. I would distinguish that, that's, that's all the only thing I would say about it. You don't read uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, who ends up with love uh, and, uh, and the history of love in, the, in, the, in how it changes, that is to say, in the Renaissance. But I would distinguish between the two. I would not use indiscriminately courtly love and medieval ideas of love. Uh, courtly love implies a formalization of love. And, and it goes back, some of you I know are writing a paper on this, uh, on Andreas Capellanus, The Art of Courtly Love, which is a way of setting rules, setting rules for love. In the perception that love is a potentially disruptive experience. And so let us make it into a joke. That's the idea. You know, let us, let us establish protocols, a code, um, by, by means of which the women and the men can really interact and tell each other uh, what, what, what this is about. Uh, don't hope marriage, because that's a serious business concerning property and wealth and status. So within the fairly uh, closed boundaries of the courtly love tradition, then you can go on making certain assumptions about yourself, about you can play all about uh, the 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 um, the greatness of women, the secret of love, you know, there's a, there's a, 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 a certain code, okay? Um, in the other forms of uh, uh, courtly love, the, or the sweet new style, the way it develops, another book that I could mention to you is Valency, V-A-L-E-N-C-Y, uh, which is uh, uh, love, something, I can't remember the title, Maurice Valency. Uh, he also discusses the shifts between Provencal understanding of love and the sweet new style uh, articulated by Dante and his coterie of, uh, of poets. Okay, that makes it, I hope, clear.
<clears throat> Thank you for a, uh, an extraordinary series of lectures. I was curious about the ending, and I wondered if you could comment on Dante's views about the papacy. I thought his choice of Bernard de Clairvaux was very curious. Um, and throughout the uh, Divine Comedy, he previously was grumbling about uh, papal, papal intervention over temporal powers. So I wondered if you could comment on that conclusion. Hmm. Yeah, very good, 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 good question. Um, of course, I, I didn't talk about it. And I think that what you're really referring to, I, I don't know, uh, but I think what you're referring to is the fact that uh, Bernard of Clairvaux uh, wrote a great book called Considera On Consideration, which seems to be about contemplative life. You know, he is uh, the great reformer of the Benedictine movement, monastic movement in, uh, in, in France and the, the so-called Cistercian monasteries, which became uh, the centers of culture, where they would copy, they would do poetry, they would write music, uh, they would sing. I mean, the, the, the arts, the way we know them, really uh, originated with him. But he wrote this text on consideration, which actually, in spite of the title, because you know that con you know what consideration is a step before you come to contemplation. You know, there are a number of reflection, consideration, and then contemplation. He, he chooses to write on, on, uh, on consideration. He dedicates the book to this treatise to Pope Eugene IV, who had been his disciple. He had been a Benedictine, with a Frenchman who had been a Benedictine a monk with him. And, it's, it's, and, and this is probably one reason why Dante chooses Bernard. Bernard, the contemplative monk, the reformer, all of paradise is populated with founders and great reformers, founders of orders, or uh, Justinian and the law, etc. right? Francis, Benedict, Dominic, Bernard, etc. So uh, in spite of the fact that he's a contemplative, Bernard did not hesitate to write a text for the spiritual edification of his ex-disciple, uh, Eugene IV, who is now a pope, and he's aware how the office of the shepherd of the church can distract him from the loftier spiritual aims and the, the longings. So it's really a sequence of arguments about what you should, how should you administer your time so that you are never really going to lose sight of what your, uh, your uh, true aim is, heaven. Um, Dante mentions this text, by the way, in a letter that so many people, not I, go on uh, uh, challenging the authority of, you know, the, the letter to Can Grande that maybe I have, no, not with you, with my graduate students, we have gone over. Uh, but to me, that is actually the indication, the fact that he refers to, uh, to, the, to the treatise by Bernard, that the authority of, he is the author of that letter. Now, you see clearly another way in which I can understand your question is that you see some kind of divergence, some sort of break. On the one hand, this kind of invective, the mode of the invective in Dante when talking about Peter, St. Peter, in Paradiso 27. I mean, he, he doesn't spare, he looks back after the examination on, uh, on, on, uh, on faith. He looks back and he starts attacking what he takes to be the usurpation of my place, my place. Remember that, that incredibly, uh, uh, moral voice that rises right, right at the very end. And that, but you seem to be worried about the fact that Dante seems to be so moral and, and when it comes about the popes and then becomes mystical all of a sudden. Is that really one of your concerns? Uh, it could be, it could become one of your concerns in asking this question about at the end of Paradise 33, he talks, talks about Bernard, such a mystic, and yet all over he's been talking about the papacy. Um, well. If you, were a if you were interested in that, I would say uh, there is no divergence in Dante between the prophetic voice and the mystical voice. That is something, even, even those who read the Bible will go and say, well, the prophets were visionaries. In a way it's true, but in a way it's not true. The prophets were not visionaries. The prophets were readers of history. They don't need to have Daniel gave an interpretation. Uh, Ezekiel has visions, but Isaiah doesn't have visions. So it's, you see what I'm saying? Uh, the, there is no clear cut distinction between the prophetic and the mystical, certainly not in Dante. The two belong together, okay? 
So that's, I don't know that I'm answering your concerns, but I, I, I overheard a number of, let's say, rumblings in your question. Uh, I'm trying to take care of. No, 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 not in the sense, no, uh, that to talk about, uh, even Bernard is someone who understands how uh, waylaying the, 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 the office can be. And he was obviously writing because he must be aware of what has been happening and what was likely to happen. You, know, you don't have to, to become a, a chronicler and a historian to do that. You, you can imagine, you know, this can happen. Uh, no, there is not that. It's not. I think that Dante's judgment about history is always very clear till the very end. Very clear. Um, history needs a reform. And of course he would say, because he's one who believes in the sacramentality and presence of the self, how the self is crucial. Before I start talking about how that the world needs reforming, let me just begin here. Uh, that would be uh, uh, an, int uh, an obvious way to say it. So I call it the language of presence in him, the sense that I am present to my own self and therefore I have responsibilities toward my own self before I, be I, became, I start using the megaphone saying, uh, let's reform the, 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 the world. That would probably, if they were ever to come, and Dante is not a utopian thinker, it would come only because so many people of goodwill, uh, <coughs> men and women of goodwill, his saints, his uh, blessed, uh, the blessed souls that he meets are willing to do something about that. No, no reconciliation, no a sense of finally things will be coming together. I don't think. Actually, I hold on to that, yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking more about um, desire and love and the fact that the will is what loves and the will always contains some element of lack or desire it seems so even if it you know can attain plenitude it still seems that Dante in talking so much about the will and the will as loving Dante says that love always has some element of lack it's not just lack there is plenitude but still there's always this restlessness and so the love at the end where there is plenitude it seems to be a completely like transformed understanding of love that it's not possible to go to return from you know in the beatific vision if you have this plenitude you know is it possible to go back because it does seem like it's a completely transformed understanding of love when you have just the plenitude and not lack anymore so with that in mind um does, is Dante ever able to attain this love? Because this love that does have plenitude seems like it should end in silence with no language. And Dante does go back and speak. And he does, um, he, he is still, he is a pilgrim and a poet. And so does he really ever move from the images to the essences? And is the uncertainty at the end, not just because we have to go on the journey ourselves, but because he is still on the journey? Yeah, uh, well, the, um I know you are, you are really voicing a very delicate issue in the poem. It's a very controversial issue um, uh, because that really imp also implies the status of the poem. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, if you really think that Dante has, seen, has had the beatific vision, and he has, and now he's writing the poem to tell us about it, then you're really saying that the poem itself belongs to a higher level of experience because it's written by someone who is in full possession of grace. That's your point, right? That's a, that's a very delicate point because I have not been teaching Dante that way, right? I have not. Were I to say this at the moment of recapitulation, uh, I probably would uh, have wasted your time all along. Uh, one little detail that I want to bring you to your attention, and then I will go to the more general problem. When Dante meets Beatrice in Purgatorio 31, this is getting really to be a recapitulation. We're talking about everything in the poem now. He meets Beatrice in Purgatorio 30 and then in 31. In Pur Purgatorio 31, Beatrice forces Dante to go into a confession. You have to go on into an admission of who you are, and it has to be public. Cannot say, well, you, I know you know, but you have to be duly ashamed. 
because only that way you can transcend whatever it is that you have uh, within you. Dante uh, reluctantly will agree to do that. And then Beatrice will say, I want you to go through this so that another time, the future tense, when you will see, we'll meet the siren, I want you to be stronger. And this to me implies, that's one of the many, uh, Dante's uh, Casella, another aesthetic temptation. One doesn't have to have the temptation to kill someone, you know, to, to really feel that one is out of, has fallen out of grace. But this is, he meets Casella and he remembers how sweet was that, that song he heard from Casella. And that sweetness still resounds within me. Now Dante is writing, is talking as a poet. He meets Ulysses. I grieve then and I grieve now. I, so there's a way in which states within the pilgrim do not really uh, go on changing. They are, the, they are the same, implying that there's some kind of continuity between pilgrimage and poetry writing. And to me, the writing of poetry is an extension of the pilgrimage. Dante though, goes on saying, I have had the beatific vision. I am now, I know what enjoyment means, not just desire, but I'm coming back to the earth and therefore I cannot come back to the earth as anything less than a human being with one project, the project to write a poem because I want to retrieve that joy and because I want to share that joy. So I have said, done two things in my answer to you. One talking about the question of the pilgrim's experience and the relationship of the, the pilgrim's experience to the writing of the poem. But I have also said that the poem stands as a sign for us, you know, a hermeneutical moment. He Dante means it for us so that we can, and, and he, his journey continues. That's my answer. Uh, you don't have to agree with it because there are, I, I know there, is, there, is, uh, there are other people. I have been fighting those people for a long time in my life. <laughs> I don't want to go back to those fights. But I think that this is uh, my way of looking at it, okay? I can give you more bibliography. I would rather not actually tell you the truth. I don't want to tell you about those people who are writing the other way. No. I, I have written about them though in my, my book, so. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how Dante views other religions, if, like in particular, Judaism, um, and if it sort of falls underneath his idea of religion as freedom, and that if you have the freedom to become an atheist, you also have the freedom to choose a different religion. Um, and if he views Judaism and Christianity as sort of a continuity, um, both driving from the same basis, or if he um, ascribes the idea of successionism that um, Christianity has um, succeeded Judaism and invalidates it, and for that reason we don't find, from what I can remember, any Jews in, in paradise. Oh, yes, you do. You do? Okay, then that's, yes, that's uh, my fault. Well, well, I have to, to correct you immediately because then maybe you rephrase, stay there, there, because you probably will rephrase the question. When uh, 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 Dante goes on listing the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the mystical rose, we even are told that Beatrice sits next to Rachel. Uh, she's, she's a way of elevating her. And then he goes on describing all the other. We talked at length about Solomon, who is a Jew, I think, right? Who is a Jew, right, in the Bible. Um, we, we went on talking about uh, Nathan. Uh, I tried to make light of it because I want to tell you that Dante saw his own name, uh, but it's Nathan, the prophet of David. And also in the harrowing of hell, which is Inferno 4, where Dante describes what happens to Jesus after his death. You know, what does he do? He harrows hell. He goes into hell. What is he doing in hell? He goes there to take the patriarchs and the women of Israel and take them to heaven. That's, these are facts. You want to change your, your question or I can go on telling you more and answering the real questions that you are, you are raising. That is to say the relationship between Christianity and Judaism and uh, and the other religions. You That's want me to talk about that? That's definitely the question that I have. That whether Dante 
um, I guess, like I said before, like I guess by um, having Jews in paradise um, and having the figure of Christ come in and, and collect the patriarchs, if he's trying to um, integrate Judaism within Christianity or somehow I don't know, yeah. find a way between well, the two. That is, uh, okay. Uh, so you're interested especially uh, about Dante's sense of uh, the relationship between Christianity and Judaism. Or you want me to also address the other issue of the way he looks at the Hindus uh, and, and the Muslims. So, so we, we talked about Dante and the other religions. In fact, when I we talked about Dante's relationship, the sense of Christianity to the other religions, I'd never mentioned the Jews. And probably that to you may have been a kind of glaring omission. Hey, this guy's talking about the big, the big religions. What about the matrix of the religions, the, the uh, Judaism? It's, it's likely. Uh, I occasionally thought maybe I should say something about that. I said no, because Dante doesn't talk about it. And so I wouldn't. Um, but Dante does talk when he has, and he's not the only one. Centuries before him, they were talking, uh, a man like, uh, a great theologian by the name of Bonaventure, a professor of theology at the University of Paris. I mentioned that text, I'm sure. Uh, in in uh, the year 1274, which is also the year of his death, he was invited to Paris. He was teaching there, but he was invited to deliver a number of lectures. And he gi gives these lectures. And then he goes on talking about uh, the other religions, the religions he knows, Hindu, and uh, the Muslim religion. And it's an argument, I mentioned that, because it seems to me that Dante follows Bonaventure fairly closely when in the Canto of St. Francis, Canto 10, the description of the, that, that legend of St. Francis, uh, Francis is said to have gone to the Sultan to try to convert him and fails. And then Dante also talks of uh, uh, the, the Hindus, with the, uh, with the references to the, the Ganges. When talking about justice, Dante is talking about Europe, but in between he alludes to the, per he talks about the Persians and the Hindu, the guy from the Hind, who is born on the river uh, Hindus, he says, the river of the Hindus. Um, so what is their conception there? The critique, they, they are talking as Christians, and they are talking from the point of view of Christianity. And the position that Bonaventure will have and Dante, I think, follows him, uh, is the following. How does it, how can, be, can they be distinguished? What do they share? They talk about what they share. What do they have in common? Uh, and they have in common, uh, especially with the case of the Muslims, the uh, biblical, the biblical, uh, the Jewish tradition. Let me just not mince words here. The Jewish tradition, that's really the, the, the common matrix for him. Um, he also notices differences. That, for instance, the theology of the Hindus is one that presumes the diffusiveness of God into all things. Okay? That's not, I don't think that's something that's unusual. What does it imply? Because then they become critical of it. It then implies the, the, the difficulty of making judgments about what's good and evil. You know, if God is everywhere, you have to, the sacrality of all things, which is a great idea, and yet, you know, there are some aspects of reality where you don't like to think that they are all alike. There is a way in which this is pantheism and, and, and can become, uh, uh, therefore, uh, can become, can be critiqued as the lack of distinctions and hierarchies and ordering. When they come to the Muslims, since the Muslim religion is one that talks about the absolute uh, impenetrability of uh, the human mind cannot ever hope to understand the divine. We are here at the mercy of God and we live only by the mercy of God. We cannot go on and say, well, but I, I live by reason and I die by reason and I can get to know God. This is, well, there is a great distance between the human and the divine. So that's the critique. If this is true, then we have nothing to then it's an absolute transcendence. And he sees Christianity as that which literally mediates between the two. Because there's a transcendence, an absolute transcendence of God, the way the Muslims understand it, but there is also a possibility of a mediation, not total mediation the way the Hindus understand it, but the mediation of the cross. 
the mediation of the incarnation. This is the way Dante takes the other religions. When it comes to the pagan religion, well, because there are the pagan religions, for instance, and, and Dante there follows very much um, the, the pagan religions, the religion of the Greeks, the religion of the Romans. And Dante follows very much uh, St. Augustine, who is the one who talks at length about, about this issue. Uh, and, and, and that's the ambiguity. There are uh, adumbrations of the divine, but at the same time, they be can become also blasphemous idols of the infernal powers. So there is this way of really the smashing, if you wish, of the idols. When it comes to Judaism, which is really the, the, the question that, that, uh, with which you started, actually, I think that Dante is, uh, uh, I talked about that. I shouldn't say that I didn't talk about it. Um, you may recall that I made a point uh, in, uh, at the beginning of uh, the readings of the poem, maybe, you know, perhaps it was not very, didn't, see, didn't seem to be very important. It, it was important to me. Uh, I, I made an, uh, I, I sort of went on talking a little bit at length about the question of birth. Remember how there are some characters, representations of ca all characters, and, and Dante continues. I could have said the same thing in the prayer to the Virgin. Virgin, mother, daughter of your son, two birds, two birds in one stone, in half, half a line, as it were, right? Daughter of your son, Dante focuses on, the, on birth. And I did say, I went on talking, since Dante talks like this about Virgil, then talks about the birth of uh, Francesca, Giacco in Canto VI, uh, Farinata in Canto X, endlessly talks about this whole issue. Uh, and then I went on talking about this, uh, this concern with birth, is uh, specifically Roman, I said. This is really a Roman insight into the importance. It's really what distinguishes uh, uh, the, the, the Greek tragic understanding of birth. You know, children can really become a curse in, in uh, when you read the, uh, the Thebaid, for instance, when you read the story of Oedipus, uh, which Statius, being half Greek, uh, sort of uh, incorporates. But then I added, after saying that this is a Roman concern, because it's, a whole, it's tied to the notion of foundation, the Roman idea that you can start things over and over again with the foundations of cities, and the birth being the way in which nature becomes historical, and therefore I potentially, like all of you, potentially can change everything around you. It's not true. As someone at a round table the other night in my department was saying that you have no experience, there are no events. Of course there are experiences and events. Every birth is an event. That's Dante's understanding because it can change history, it can change the future. After making this statement that that's a Roman idea, and for Dante that's crucial because he is a Roman and he thinks of himself as a Roman, Florence is the daughter of Rome, then I added that this is also a Jewish idea of creation. That that's really what we have, mainly the, the great invention that we have in the Bible, that the world was created. And that Dante is connecting two ideas, a Roman and a Jewish idea, which are miraculously convergent. Is this an act of usurpation? Uh, because that's really the, 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 what I read in your question. Is that an appropriation? Uh, it's culture. I think that that's really what uh, you do. But you can say that about the Bible. You read. The Bible is a reading of history. Uh, over 800 years of its composition, it's a reading of events around them and the culture and values. And that's exactly what Dante does. So uh, how does he look at, uh, uh, he thinks that the, the Jews, are, I guess he's really saying they are not Christians, but they believe in a Christ to come and that will save them. You know, this really means that there is a, a, an acknowledgement of the dignity and, 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 uh, uh, and certainly originality of that vision. I answered clearly. Okay, you may agree, you may not agree, but it's clear, uh, th we agree about that. I was wondering if you could just brief. Oh, thank you. Up here. You are much taller than any, <laughs> any microphone in the universe. Oh, thank you. 
I was wondering if you could discuss the presence of violence in all of these texts that we've been reading. I'm thinking particularly about the Vita Nuova and the depiction of violence in these dreams filled with passion and a very strange um, representations of the color red and all of, as both a lost full color, the fear of death in these depictions of love, which reminds me of courtly love and this idea that um, our passions are sort of transcendental, violent dreams and images that come to us. But So that's one question of one part. But the other is the presence of violence and violent imagery in Paradiso. I'm thinking particularly about Martius at the beginning in Canto One. Also, um, the implied moral violation of Picarda and these continuous images that remind us of human violence and passions violence. And I wonder how they fit in with the final vision of yeah. of the beatitude and human love. So. Yeah, that's uh, that, that that brings us right back to the 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 relationship between the historical and uh, and the sacred. Really, so that violence is uh, uh, a parody almost of the sacred, and in many ways the alibi for the sacred, because the sacred is, is to be understood as that which tries to redeem the violence. And Dante, you're absolutely right, never flinches from uh, uh, the understanding that the, the world of, of history is an economy of, of, of this ongoing, ongoing violence. It's, it's true. Um, he, uh, he even addresses, you're right, he does, the, the human beings, uh, the Cato, who kills himself, uh, hoping that with his death he can bring an end to the civil war in Rome between Caesar and Pompey. Um, but then the violence that someone like Picard, that you absolutely, uh, how love engenders violence, the incredible thing is that you have perversions. It's not just, you know, that I, I, I kill because I want to steal someone's uh, shoes, you know. Uh, but then there is a way in which I think I'm in engaged uh, a more tragic understanding of violence because it's sort of, it's so mediated and so disguised as love, right? I can love from Paolo and Francesca and yet that engenders a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of violence. Uh, and Dante has, has gone through all the phases for this, this sort of thinking, uh, that of thinking that maybe that's really what history is about. It's all about violence and that any effort at redemption, Christ's redemption of violence, that's really what uh, the whole story of, of, of uh, Christian salvation is about. Dante mentions that. This is not a uh, kind of an opinion. Dante will mention it in, in Inferno 33, you remember? With uh, the story of uh, Ugolino uh, in the background of that scene, of that, that the famous uh, cannibalizing, there is the story of the children uh, have, been, have been killed to his children. Um, and, you know, and that's always the, the death of the innocent. It's really the beginning. You know, what happens to the children? We, we can go on arguing, but what about this, these kids who have no response, who are innocent, as Dante says? And then you overhear in the background, and I think that Dante wants us to overhear, the experience of, uh, of, of the cross that was meant to redeem all violence and it didn't seem to work. So there's a way in which he thinks that violence has even, to the notion and to the God of violence, even the redemption succumbs to that vision. The, the idea of redemption loses in connection with uh, and in relation to violence. So that, that would be the way we can, uh, we can come to uh, to, to understand it. And there are a number of other extensions. Even when we read, Dante will say, when we read, it seems to be such an innocuous, bland operation that we're in, engaged in, right, in the, in, the, in the quiet of our studies, etc. Then we are still violating the integrity of a text. We still extract, we still break up that unity. We isolate a passage. We make part of what we want 
what I wanted to signify, hermeneutics, is linked, interpretation is linked to experience of violence. What gives? Okay, so we agree there. That was your question. How does Dante get beyond that and, and somehow manage to arrive to a beatific vision? I think that what Dante is doing is denouncing all forms of violence, confessing to them, admitting them, dramatizing them. It doesn't mean that he's espousing them or he shares them, okay? The whole point of the Divine Comedy is to acknowledge that it lodges, it, violence, lodges even in him and within him, but he wants to move beyond it. And that's the ascetic aspect of his text. Ascetic in the sense that he's literally climbing up the ladder of uh, transcending that which is holding him back. Uh, and I don't think that, you know, if you're looking for a way that does, then he, does he get away from it? Because that's really the, 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 the other question. Does he ever get away? Not in the measure in which he's human and wants to remain human, open to these temptations all the time. Okay. Oh, please. As a, as a pilgrim who has become a senior citizen, I have had a question throughout the entire course. And having read Auerbach and Thomas Bergen and Mary Reynolds and others, the question has not been answered for me. And I'm not sure you can either. Uh, the, the question is, you know, who, who is Dante? Uh, as we've been responding to these, you've been responding to these questions here, I've jotted down human, man, citizen, exile, lover, poet, pilgrim, visionary, theologian, saint, uh, Paul, and Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Bernard of Garbo had their visions and they became saints. Is this man a saint? Uh, well, I, 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 I'm taking a little bit of time to, uh, to answer because uh, I, you must know, I think you know, that actually there are people who think that he should be canonized. You probably do not know that, who think that they should be canonized. Actually, I was actually interviewed once about <laughs> soliciting my ideas. I said, I hope not, because I want to teach him for what I think he is, a poet. You know, a poet, a man of extraordinary imagination who divines our time. That's what I think is the power of the imagination and who understands that the greatest call on him and on us is really the possibility of the encounter with the divine. I don't know. I hate it. If I were to make a movie about that, I have been, I have been, <laughs> sometimes some people have been, uh, I have been mentioning it to people actually. The, I would make him. Uh, uh, I would make him into a rebellious type, you know, who uh, seems to understand everything that he touches. But he also has a way, and takes, as he should, from everything, and transforms it. So he has a vision from that point of view, the vision of how the world is and ought to be. He invents the world. He invents the world. His world. The world of the divine comedy, it's, it's an extraordinary invention. But a saint, I don't know what these other guys have done exactly to make them deserving of sainthood. Uh, but maybe I'll leave it there. I don't know. I don't know. Thank you. I think it's time. Thank you so much for your great questions. Thanks.